Hello and welcome to Journalist Hangout UK. This is a show where we discuss issues both African and worldwide, which are affecting the continent. And we look at how these issues are seen at home and in the African diaspora. I'm Thompson Ngojo, and I'm pleased to welcome our panel. Vuiswa Ngobongwan, a broadcaster. Juliana Olainka, journalist and broadcaster. And Lanre Akinola, editor of African Business. Welcome. Um, Julie, this is uh, a week where we saw some things that appeared never to end, ending in Asen Wenger saying he's going to call it quits. But also, uh, maybe Juliana, to start with you, a big week for, for the Commonwealth, especially during the time where the British were facing difficult challenges with some of the former colonies, the Caribbean, with the Windrush, uh, the Stephen Lawrence thing. Do you think this is an opportunity for them to probably restore and repair some of those relations? No, I don't. Uh, I think there was an article I read in the Washington Post this morning that kind of described the Commonwealth as an old antique in the living room. You know, you don't want to throw it away, but you don't really know what to do with it. And I kind of feel like that defines uh, Britain's relationship uh, with the Commonwealth. Yeah, but um, Landry, probably just to put this into context, Britain dominates the Commonwealth in terms of the economy, in terms of the culture, the language. So what would be the point for the other countries? Well, that's, that, that is a core question. Um, the term Commonwealth suggests it's some sort of mutual, mutually beneficial arrangement, but of course we know that it's a, mostly a group of former British colonies and that it was sort of, you know, Britain doing them a favor or giving them membership in this little club that they control and dominate. Now we've got the Queen saying she wants her son Prince Charles to take over. In the 21st century, in the multipolar world we live in, where Asia is dominant, where China is rising, where the Middle East is, is moving, where Latin America is moving, the Commonwealth feels like very much like an antique. Yes. I, I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, Vuiswa, if, uh, if you are talking about Commonwealth, the aspiration surely, when you go back to the KG6 uh, days, 1949, it was all about saying we are all going to be equal under mm -hmm. one Commonwealth flag. Yes. Is, is that happening? Well, obviously, time has shown that that was a really red-hot lie. And whether we learn from it or not is very much dependent on our perspective. Most of the African leaders you see gathered here in London are, in the big picture, just puppets, essentially. No offense personally to any of them. Look at Cyril Ramaphosa, the ultimate pragmatist for Southern Africa agreeing behind closed doors, because we won't hear much headlines about it, to accept a huge loan from Britain, which will tie South Africa somehow economically to the British um, you know, financial system. At what price for us long term? And I look at financial institutions like BRICS, which are trying to create an alternative economic forum to create more equity for the dispossessed majority of the world, and South Africa is easing her way out of that. To what? And I'm annoyed that this Commonwealth, which is an illusion, as Lanre has said, is being utilized to take a measure of where these African nations are in regard to their progress for the interests of their own people and an opportunity for Britain and the dominant colonial power to actually steal for itself what it can to offset the disadvantages of coming out of Brexit. That's what's going on in London right now. Right. Um, Juliana, there's something that you mentioned earlier. Um, which was quite interesting, and mm. in that you, you thought this is not a replacement, it cannot be a replacement in terms of Brexit and the EU. Well, Britain moved away from the Commonwealth pretty much uh, towards the EU, you know, since 1975. Um, is there reason for Britain not to believe that the Commonwealth is a proper platform to, to compensate uh, the loss <coughs> of whatever they, they might lose from the EU. Well, I think it's hard to follow we there. But um, I think that Britain have always had their hand in the Commonwealth, even if, you know, their, their attention was focused more on their membership of the European Union. You know, they've always been interested and observed what its Commonwealth members are doing. And, you know, some Commonwealth members are industrialised, wealthy nations like Canada um, and New Zealand, of course, India. Um, but it has to be a mutual relationship. I think India, and we all know that India is probably 
Britain's, you know, biggest loss from its colonial empire. You know, they've said, well, OK, that's fine. If you want to start doing trade with us, what are we going to be benefiting from that? You know, are you going to allow visa free access for our students, for our nurses, for the people that are coming over? So um, I think Britain do have benefits uh, from, you know, making that relationship stronger. But I don't think it's for a trade relationship because, of course, only 9% of trade is with Commonwealth members. I think it's more to show the Europe and to show America, to show the rest of the world that they have friends. Because, of course, you know, they mutually speak English. There are more than a billion members of the Commonwealth. Um, so I think it's to show that, yeah, you know, we are old yeah. Britain yeah. and yeah. we do have people supporting us. Yeah, Landry. Um you know, the, the calendar might not allow Prime Minister Trudeau of uh, Canada to be available for the royal wedding. But, um, you know, he's being, um, he's, <laughs> he's being cautiously optimistic that it could be a trade deal yeah. between Canada, uh, uh, between optimistic. Ottawa and London, uh, yeah. Course. But Nigeria, of mm -hmm. course, we know is a big market. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know is a very important country for anyone who wants to do well in trade. Yeah. So uh, President Buhari is, um, well, he has been around. Mm -hmm. so yes. What do you think will come out of that? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I don't think that it will be revolutionary no matter what happens. When uh, Trudeau says he's cautiously optimistic about a trade deal, he's saying that because he understands it will take about 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. even under, under sort of good circumstances to get there. In Africa, it's going to take much longer than that. The reality is that within the Commonwealth, Africa is not a priority for Britain. India is, because India was the big loss. This is a reaction to the chaos of Brexit. It is reflective of the desperation in Westminster, because it is clear that there is no coherent strategy around this. There's been talk of an Africa free trade zone. No details have been provided on any of this. So we go back to this question of what's in it for African countries. It's not clear at all. Yeah. When you break it down, there are few countries that are probably going to be relevant here. Mm -hmm. Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, all for the obvious reason, former col uh, British colonies, big economies in Africa. But those relationships already exist. They don't need the Commonwealth. Those bilateral discussions are taking place anyway. Uh, Buhari is going to speak to Theresa May with or without the Commonwealth. So we come back to this question of what's the point of it? It's not clear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Boiswa, there's something quite interesting here. Um, there, there was a belief or probably a perception that a lot of people that voted for Brexit in Britain uh, were against immigration. They spoke about the Polish people, you know, white East Europeans coming mm -hmm. to Britain and they didn't like that. Um, but then there's a question that if you want trade deals with India, then that will come with um, free movement of people. You, you are opening up for another billion to come. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you include Nigeria, 200 million people. Um, and if you include Pakistan, another 180 million people. So how do you see that balance, the need for free trade and uh, the fact that um, free movement of people might be a reality? Well, it's not really a balance, I think, that we should be talking about. We should really be talking about what is the actual um, nitty-gritty of this financial agreement deal, you know? And that's what I'd like programs like Lanre's program called The Business to actually help ordinary people to understand because everything else, all the headlines, are really grandstanding. And yeah. to ask a question like, what's the impact of a million or billion Indians having the opportunity <laughs> to come, doesn't really move us forward. Um, we will know that there will be a reaction, there will be a lot of drama about their taking our jobs. Hello, we have, we've had this discussion forever. That's not really the issue. I would like to question the very veracity of having a commonwealth in the 21st century. Okay, let me, let me put this another And ask African way. countries yes. to discuss what Colonel Gaddafi was killed for, which is a pan-Africanist concept of yeah. Africans discussing how they can use their incredible economic power okay. to work okay. for each other. Let, let, let me Frightening move discussion yeah, for the Let West. me move you to a social discussion, um, but, but probably very briefly. Uh, the, the values, the issues, because it's about language. Commonwealth was about the wealth, about the language, about the culture. About and dominating the, the majority no, no, of I, I the world. The, the, the what was common was English. What yeah. was common was English people in charge. What was common was English people running the agenda. And we just became Wait, puppets. Okay. If I, if I'm Amanda, sorry, I, let's I, tell it as it is. I'd, I'd like to just comment on this thing about immigration because I think it actually touches on a, a, a fundamental dynamic here, which is Britain cannot expect in 2018 to go out to the world to fast-growing emerging 
emerging economies and say, we want to do special trade deals with you, but we won't accept any students mm -hmm. to come and study in our country. We won't accept any high-skilled migrants to come and work in our country. We're going to treat your citizens like, like, like dirt, but mm -hmm. we want your money, we want your investment. Yeah. And okay. also, that's that, not going to work. Can I just ask London, what is the punishment, for example, yeah. if Ramaphosa says, no, Britain, I want okay. to join BRICS? Okay, let me, let me stop you. Let, let me uh, let, let me stop you happen. briefly. Let me stop you briefly because Juliana's uh, cup of tea is here now. So we'll take a quick <laughs> break. Um, and but there's plenty more that we have to discuss, as you can see. So please join us in a few moments. Hello and welcome back to Journalist Hangout UK. I'm Tamsin Rajo and I'm pleased to welcome back our panel, Vuiswa Ngobongwana, Juliana Olainka, and Landre Akinola. Before we pick up the discussion on the Commonwealth, earlier I interviewed Gwenga Onitilo, a policy analyst in Lagos, Nigeria, and I began by asking him how Nigerians feel about the Commonwealth. I think there is a lot of mixed feelings. Um, some, some on the side of um, the world is now a global village. And um, Nigeria being one of the nations being colonized by the United Kingdom. And so becoming, being, being a part of a league of about 54 nations that control about 30% of uh, the population of the world. So first to us, a lot of opportunities in terms of trade, investment, collaborations along the lines of security, tough also is huge for a country uh, um, that is just coming out of recession, also focusing on um, diversifying the economy and joining investment. So it, it, it provides a lot of opportunity to that effect. But when you look at Nigeria today, in terms of the values coming from the colonial system, maybe Christianity yeah. included, how do people yeah. view these? Uh, well, for, in, in, in terms of Nigeria, um, still very less to be, to be said we have gained in terms of when we look at where we are uh, in terms of our industrial age, when we're looking at human developmental index, when we look at things like security, when we look at healthcare, when we look at education. Um, I wouldn't say... So much has been done to enhance Nigeria. But when we look at also the political scene, the United Kingdom, one way or the other, has influence politically on who presides over the Afghan of the nation, notwithstanding that we go through elections every four years. And um, when, we now see, when, when decisions are being made on the political scene, they, they see a bit of interference from the for, former colonial masters and the superpowers, and because Nigeria has not been able, people call us the, global, the giant of Africa, but giant of Africa only in terms of numbers, population, but in terms of capacity, in terms of development, in terms of relevance, to be able to put strong foreign policies, I think we are not there yet. Now, President Buhari, uh, when he came to London this time, he met um, the corporate leadership of Shell. He met the yeah. British government. He's doing deals. And what he says is uh, what he's going to, to bring home this time is something that is going to help Nigeria and Nigerians. What is the feeling on the ground? What Shell is only putting on the table is about $20 billion. It's just their operational expenditures in terms of what they tend to spend. But when we now look at in terms of how long companies like Shell have been in Nigeria, looking at the Niger Delta region, for example, in terms of development, when it comes to Human Developmental Index, with the amount of revenue that has been generated from that region, and the way the, the region has been subsidized uh, in terms of uh, land mass, in terms of water surfaces, and how that has impacted on livelihood of the people. 
it doesn't really excite me at the end of the day because at the end of the day, you have massive investment coming into the country, but you don't see human development. Before I let you go, uh, Bwenga, uh, the, there was contestation in terms of uh, who takes over in the event that uh, the Queen is no longer available to lead the Commonwealth. And she yeah. suggested that uh, Prince Charles, her son, will take over because she took over from her father, KG6. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting has uh, endorsed her suggestion. So Prince Charles is now the person that is expected to take over. Where do you see the Commonwealth going in general? In terms of um, a, a group like the Commonwealth, uh, that controls about half a percent of the world's population, and um, the, lead, the kind of leadership that has been provided, Prince Charles has had an history of a lot of controversy, which has made some people question his capacity to provide leadership. But at the end of the day, it's more like the Secretary General that really has more of administrative control. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Gwenga Onitilov, thank you very much for joining us. So picking up from where we left off, we got heated up in, during the time just before the break. Um, and after Chapman, I understand that um, the mess in the Nigerian Senate is still in its place, so decisions um, can be made. But uh, that is just one of those things that come from the West or from Britain after the colonial system that there are so many things, Juliana, that were important into Africa. But when you talk about 2.4, 2.5 billion people in different countries with different cultures and different values, how do you then make that common within the Commonwealth? I think that's Britain's biggest uh, problem, which is why I feel like the Commonwealth is more diplomatic than it is kind of realistic. Um, for example, homosexuality, that's been a huge thing that's been discussed. A lot of people have been protesting on the streets, asking why you're allowing certain heads of state to have what they consider archaic laws in place, particularly concerning homosexuality. And there's going to be no budge, which is why there's been stronger relations recently between Africa and China and Africa and some I would say America, but not as much, because, you know, that relationship isn't colonial. They're saying, we accept your laws, we accept the way you treat your people, and we want to do deals with you. Whereas Britain, because where it stands in its high and mighty place, and because, of course, it's, you know, it, it's, it's known as a place where, you know, human rights issues are taken to, you know, its highest height. Um, and I think that's where there is going to be a pressing issue, because how can you say, yes, you know, we're saying bye to Europe and we're saying hello to Africa, but, um, you know, homosexuality is prosecuted, etc., etc. And I think that's going to be a big uh, sticking point going forward. Yeah. Um, Landry, this is, this is quite tricky, isn't it? Because there are quite a number of people who say um, Africa had no problems with these things before. The colonial system taught them that uh, this was wrong. And once they invested in these values, mm -hmm. then Britain is coming back and saying, no, you should not be doing that. We will punish you economically and this. So that, that, that creates a very difficult well, it, atmosphere. It, it, it? it just reflects that the Commonwealth, in, in terms of how it's organized and the philosophy and thinking behind it is, it, it is whether we like it or not, out of step with where the world is. Um, in the 21st century, the global economy is all about trade. A big part of that is just pragmatism. Um, that is not about are you a good person or a bad person. That's not how policy decisions are made. Policy decisions are made on mutual interest, mutual financial and economic gain. And if the Commonwealth thinks it can come with this attitude of unless you do this, we will not do anything with you, that's the 1970s, 80s and 90s. That's the IMF, World Bank, structural adjustment period. We're in a period now where Africa can say, well, okay, we're talking to Beijing, who are offering 10 times as much as you, and are not giving us, no this, strings kind, attached. Not giving us this kind of hassle. So why exactly should we be talking to the Commonwealth? There's no good reason. Yeah. Um, you see, if we take from, from Landry's point, uh, from time to time there are nations that have disagreed with the Commonwealth, South Africa for one, um, during you know, the Botha years um, after Foster. They left and they came back again, of course, after the fall of apartheid. Zimbabwe left under Robert Mugabe. Uh, they are negotiating their way back. The Gambia, 
left under Jame. They are now back. Um, so, but there will be advantages. So when Ramaphosa came, what do you think he was hoping to achieve and what do you think he will take back home um, after this summit? I think he wanted to put at ease um, the, the ruling elite in the world, which are very much represented by the powers that live in the city of London and run the uh, financial system, as you know, Lanre. That's just how it works. We're not arguing about that. We're just stating it. And it needs to be stated over and over again. Because the whole discussion about the Commonwealth is based on the assumption that we're discussing an even playing field. Well, how can you discuss homosexuality in the Gambia? when the main thing is for people to eat their food. Mm -hmm. Of course they're going to argue with you about that, you know? So, and when we start doing that, the discussion becomes about, look how backward African countries are with regard to homosexuality, when in reality, we can barely have a sense of pride in who we are and address the common economic problems that our governments are beleaguered with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So when they come here to London in all their fine African finery, they're not really representing the best interests of the majority of their people. They've got this interesting balancing act of pleasing the former master. And when they, uh, uh, they report back to their capitals, maybe we will get uh, something else when the whole thing is over. Don't forget to follow us on Real JHUK on Facebook, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Tamsin Ngajo and from the entire team here in London, goodbye. And thank you for watching Journalists Hangout UK.